so we will get started with the consent agenda. We have previous minutes and a, a number of policies. Um, there was a lot of redlining and changes uh, in those policies. Any discussion or questions about either the prior minutes or that um, matter of policies? I have a question um, on one of the policies. Uh, I believe it's, um, well, there's two, actually. The first one is about the class ranking. And it says this policy will remain in effect until replaced by the Latin honor system by Enos Square High Schools for the graduating classes. So basically this year. Is that saying that this policy is in effect or not in effect? So it's, it's up for deletion because it's... Wait, class rank or I have to open that. Class rank or boss out? Which are you? It's, it's G10, which says class rank slash thou slash thou policy. <laughs> like the way it reads, it says it's being re that, that the Latin honors will replace this year. So I'm confused. The Latin honors is already the practice. It's already happening. We have it on our agenda for policy to work through the Latin honors policy, but right now there is no Valsal. So it, it sunsetted already. So then does this not should this should this should this not be in there? Let me find it. Okay. And my other question on that is we are maintaining a ranking system for those that need it, correct? <clears throat> Uh, did you say G10? Yeah, it's G10. It's in that second, there were two separate PDFs of policy. I was in the wrong one. I had no page, It's page 11. Uh, huh? Did you make yourself? No, I didn't get around to that. <laughs> I thought you were down there like, there. It's good for you. Yeah. Sometimes it helps. So, um, we don't know what's wrong with okay, it. It usually works all the time. But the projector is just not connecting to anything. I mean, if Polly's so right, the way it reads, it makes it, it makes it sound as though the Latin Honor system isn't actually one of our the current system. On the table, or it is. It's in practice. It just hadn't been updated in policy. I know, so I if you're uncomfortable with deleting this before we have the addition of that like formal policy, we can pause on this so one. It's this and then system. when we bring back so the Latin I'm not sure honor what you approval, we can have you vote to. No, um, I think this one is. Right. I think you just leave it as is for right now. Okay. And then we'll bring you the new one, which will replace this. Okay. And then my second question was around the, um, is it the parent, what is it? Parent involvement policy. And that's slated to start next year, or do we already do these practices? So this is something that was identified through our um, an audit last year. Almost every school, I think, in the state, none of the family engagement policies met the expectations of ESSA. Um, so we had to have a we have a new model policy from the VSBA. So what you see there is essentially the new model policy. So we are. A, asking to adopt that new model policy because it actually has all of the components that are built into those requirements that our other, other policy didn't have. So we're working to build this year. It's not all in place yet, but we're, we're working to build all of those components this year. And you're gonna see that policy again um, 
So the way it is right now, you see some parts near the end that are grayed out because they have to be developed at the school level, which is in opposition to how we typically do policy. Policy is generally SU level um, as a supervisor union. But in this case, for that family engagement policy, we're going to have to have separate sections for schools. So it's a work in progress, Polly. Okay, so that's what I was wondering, because like when it's talking about the compact and then the evaluation of the compact, so that's that's what we're working towards. Yes, I just okay. had a meeting about that this afternoon. Um, okay. each, each school is going to have someone working to lead that work. It's going to be a heavy lift um, on top of everything else that feels like a heavy lift this year. And we're going to be looking to get parent feedback, um, put some teams together to try to work through those expectations. Okay, those are the only questions I had on those. So I'm ready to go if anybody else has any questions. Um, thanks, Polly. And so just to clarify, um, do we want to exclude the grading um, ranking policy for now from this uh, motion on the on these policies and put a pin in that one? Is that Would that be your preference, Polly, until they rework it and bring it back? Yeah, so I guess my motion would be to um, approve uh, the policies presented with G10 being status quo for right now. No changes made to it at this point. Okay. Yeah. All right. I um, there any, can I just clarify there were, there were no changes that you saw proposed in that, correct? Correct. So if you were to approve it, it's approved as written, just like all of the others. But and as written, it kind of says it should go away if we're going to. It will because right. the, the, the Latin honors is going to include the ranking. Right. It just yeah. seems weird that we're approving something we don't want. So <laughs> yeah, yes. Totally wrong order. <laughs> okay, great. So that's the motion. Um, I'll do this by roll, um, Polly. Aye. Kat. Aye. Emily. Rick. Aye. And Mary is an aye. And Morgan, we don't have Kevin yet. I can't see everyone on my screen. That is correct. Okay, great. All right. So um, any, uh, Lynn, or do you have any need to reprioritize the agenda or any board members have a need to reprioritize the flow of the evening? I do not, Mary. Okay, so we'll move on to our recognition of visitors and our public comment period. Um, so I guess what would be helpful, Morgan, is if I can um, get a list of names of our virtual visitors and then hear from them as to whether they would like comment time. And then I'm going to find out who is in the public service building and, um, and then we'll start our public comment. We'll start and I will start just for those of you who are virtual. I think I'll start with everyone who's at the public service building and then move on to virtual folks if they would like to have public comment. So I see Sharon, I see Sharon Zeccanelli. Are you hoping to speak this evening, Sharon? Yes, ma'am. Okay, super. And I see, who else, Morgan? My screen is a little funny here, virtually. Um, I'm trying to chat people as well. There's someone, uh, Cameron Paquette, James Clark, and Don with no last name. All right, so James Clark, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, welcome. Um, are you hoping to comment uh, in public comment tonight? Uh, yep. Okay, great. And Cameron, can you hear me? And are you hoping to speak tonight during public comment? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Morgan, you said we had, oh, we have someone, Dawn, no last name, not Dawn Reed, obviously. Are you able to hear me, Dawn? It is Dawn Reed, she's on twice. 
Oh, okay. So it's not another Dawn. Okay. So virtually then we just have James and Sharon and, and both for James and Sharon, if you don't mind, I'll do the public comment from everyone in the, um, public service building first, and then I'll circle back to you if that's okay. Mary, Mary I do see a, an Amanda with no last name and I see Amanda Blaney, who I know is in the room at public safety. So I don't know if, if she's logged in twice. Oh, okay. There's another Amanda. I believe she's logged in twice. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. And Morgan, who, let, now we need to get clear on who is at the public service uh, space. And so are they now able to hear us and see us? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, Sorry. great. Um, it would be helpful for me to know how many people are hoping to speak tonight. Maybe a show of hands. One, two, three. Am I counting? I see four. Am I right, folks? Five. Michelle, Five. Guess I'm not speaking tonight. Okay. So, so four. Okay. So we're gonna do um, a three-minute time limit per person because uh, we have a number of people to get uh, to get through. Um, and I'll start with, um, we'll, we'll work our way through the people in the public service building first. So whoever wants, whoever wants to start, and it would be helpful to have a name and town of residence uh, as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Jared Ballacourt from Berkshire. Hi, Jared. Hi. Thanks. Trying to look at you down here. Yeah. Parents are supposed to be the primary stakeholders in their children's education. Yet parents seem to have less and less influence over what our children are exposed to in schools. A board member told us that critical race theory and diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI initiatives, are important components in creating equitable learning opportunities. At the last school board meeting, we listened to the presentation from the DEI coordinator, Michelle Irish. Although we agree with some points from this presentation, we have concerns on the following. Michelle stated, quote, this audit tool that we're looking at, that we're using, leads us to explore equity in the hidden curriculum through identity lenses, including disability, race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, economic disadvantage, et cetera, end quote. We previously shared concerns parents have brought to us about what is happening in our schools. One concern involved an assignment that asked students who they were sexually attracted to, their personal political views, their religious affiliation, the gender they identify with, etc. We've been told this assignment is not condoned, but is clearly in line with the hidden curriculum goals of the FNESU diversity program. Through identity lenses, friendly words like diversity, equity, and inclusion are used to cover up a divisive and harmful agenda that is taught to vulnerable students. Through identity lenses, you sacrifice the innocence of our children in order to promote ideologies based on classifications like race and gender. Any time a lens is used, you lose sight of the bigger picture. Michelle was asked who would be included in this audit. She advised that it is a comprehensive look into all schools for the full day, from pre-K to 12, including the after-school program and the tech center and teachers will be collecting the data. From pre-K to 12, three and four-year-olds. Michelle also stated, quote, we'll be exploring the expression of our beliefs and our assumptions about who and what is important, who or what is represented or excluded, what knowledge is important, and who has or does not have access to information, end quote. Please do not teach our children what to think. Schools should be teaching them how to think. We want to know, first, will parents be given the opportunity to opt their children out of these audits? Second, how much is it costing this district to train staff and conduct these audits? Third, how many hours and resources are being devoted to these audits? Fourth, prior to these initiatives, our experience has been that each student's needs have been evaluated and addressed in the school district. Were FNESU students not 
given the opportunity to learn in a multicultural school environment prior to introducing these DEI initiatives? If so, how? And fifth, can you please provide a link on the FNESU website to the material used in the anti-racism and DEI training provided to staff, as well as the associated curriculum for the students? We previously asked what you're doing to protect our children from the negative examples caused by these DEI initiatives. However, after listening to the DEI presentation, we now understand the harmful effects of grooming children to provide sensitive personal information is being encouraged. In closing, children are not born with prejudices. They have to be taught. You admit your goal is to use identity lenses and to explore beliefs and assumptions about who and what is important and what knowledge is important. To teach with a lens is to teach prejudices. Can you please keep our resources at academics instead of promoting ideologies and just let our kids be kids? Thank you. They're not going to answer your questions? Yeah. No, they don't no. answer your questions. Oh, really? No. My name is Kathleen Shadd, and I'm from Fairfax. From Cuba. I'm here to speak about the vaccine. It was my understanding when we were here before that before vaccines were brought into the schools, parents were going to be offered a choice whether or not they wanted to have the vaccines in the school. They were told that they were going to be administered through the pediatrician's office or pharmacies. As far as I know, not a single parent was asked whether or not they want these vaccines administered in the school. The WHO has also released a statement saying if children are attending public schools, this is their automatic compliance to the vaccine. So whether or not a parent knows that they're allowing their child to be vaccinated against their will, this is happening just for the simple fact that their child attends a public school. So these vaccines can be administered to children without a parent's knowledge, which is criminal. And we know, we know that this is the plan. Aside from the fact that not a single one of these vaccines has been approved from the FDA, and the only one that has been is not even in production, what is released in these vaccines is only done by the doctors that have done behind the scenes investigations into the ingredients because the pharmaceutical companies still have not released the ingredients. We know that there's formaldehyde, which is an embalming fluid. We know that there's graphene oxide, which is toxic to human beings. And we know that there's aborted human fetal tissue. We also know that these vaccines are causing heart attacks, stroke, numbness, Bell's palsy, blood clots, in adults, in teenagers, and in children. I don't know very many or any 12-year-old that's ever had a heart attack, but apparently this is considered normal now. Another doctor has also come forward, uh, excuse me, a, a mortician has come forward saying that he has actually witnessed the death rate of babies being miscarried or born, stillborn, born dead, at 10 times the rate that it usually is. He said when he goes to the morgue to pick up the dead bodies, it's more than half filled with adults now, or uh, babies now. So it's really upsetting to know that these vaccines are going to be administered to children in schools where they have absolutely no place being. This is supposed to be a place of education, not where you administer toxic ingredients to children without their parents' consent. I'd also like to note that in and one of... About 10 more seconds, please, if you could wrap up. Thank you. Okay, then I will say that to be complacent is the same as being guilty. If you are going along with this and you're afraid to speak out just for the simple fact that you might lose your job, 
I think that the fact that we know that injuries are happening is um, making those involved blood guilty. And if you are complacent and going along with this, then you're just as guilty. And the Bible says that if you are blood guilty of the innocent, there's no redemption for you and there's no sense in even praying for you because you're beyond, you're beyond prayer. And so I hope that the... Uh, those people that can step forward and actually stop this from happening do because you're going to be seeing an awful lot of children dying very, very soon. And when we hear the term dark right, winter, need, that's what it is. I need you to wrap up, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They don't care. You can go. My name is Sally Hale. I'm an Enosburg resident. And I'm going to pretty much say the same thing that I did last time. Only this time, I'm really pissed. Why? Because I have a sister in high school. And you know what's happening to her? People are testing positive who are vaccinated. And what has to happen? She is perfectly healthy. She has to stay home. She has to, she cannot participate in any school events because you guys decided that the unvaccinated doesn't get to participate if someone else tests positive. That's segregation. You can keep going on and on about how much evidence we have put on. You have the evidence. You know exactly what it is. It's been over a year. We, the people, have given you enough chances. Honestly, it's getting ridiculous. And we've had it. And yeah, there may not only be a few people here that are willing to speak up, but you've got to start thinking. Either you, A, are going to start listening to the we the people and have this a public school, or B, you're going to move aside, let someone else that is willing to do it, do it, or C, when the tide comes, and it will, because what has done in the dark will be brought to the light. You will have to answer for your sins. And that's all I'm going to say. And I'm sick and tired of you using our children to either A, you know, keep going with your whole fear thing that you have believed in, or lining your pockets. It's all about the money, isn't it? Who cares about the children, right? I care. We care, and we're sick and tired of you using our children to push your agenda. And this goes for everything, not just the mask, not just the vaccine. All your, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that because you know what? You guys know exactly what you've done wrong, and you know you will get in trouble for it eventually. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow, but you will have to answer for your sins. And I'm telling you right now, you either change your tune or you will get prosecuted for it. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Jim Sexton. I'm from Esk Center. First thing I'm going to say is the same thing that we said last time. You all, you all don't feel any responsibility to answer any of these questions. You know, there's townspeople here. There are a whole lot of townspeople here, but it doesn't matter if there's only one. You don't answer the questions. You're responsible to these people. You are elected to the school board. That will come a time, too, if, you're not, if you do not have the courage to resign before the next election. You will be replaced at the next election because there are enough people here to say, we're done with everything you're doing to the kids. Okay? What I've been doing because you are so adamant about forcing the mask, and actually the superintendents are saying force the mask on the kids. Let's go see Scott and force the mask. I brought this packet up last time. I don't know where it ended up, but you all are determined to force the mask on the kids. Here's the box of masks that you purchased that everybody has on their face, a paper and cloth mask. Right there and on my paperwork, it says these masks are not for personal protection. They are not protecting anybody. They can't physically do that. But you know what? It doesn't matter about facts. 
because you're all smart enough to understand the facts. You understand the facts when there's 100,000 people in a football stadium screaming their lungs out, breathing all over each other. That's not a risk for COVID. But 20 kids in a classroom is. But no, 20 kids aren't when they're not home, when they're at home or at their store or with their parents or whatever. That's not a COVID risk. But when they sit down in your school, they're going to kill each other and everybody else. Sounds pretty stupid, doesn't it? Anybody understand that? Yeah, get it. Yeah, y'all understand it. Yeah. How come you guys don't understand it? Just but, but here's the question. You do understand it. But you're getting money from the state to force these mandates on the kids. Okay, we all know about that. And that's going to come to light, too. So these people deserve an answer. You didn't answer them last time, over a month ago. Time to answer these questions. Got some real smart questions in here. Got some real facts. And you're not answering to any of them. You need to step up or you need to resign. Thank you, Jim. Is there anyone else in the public service building who would like to comment for public comment? I think we had four people. I just want to make sure I got to everyone. All right. Um, so then we'll move to the folks who are in the virtual meeting and Sharon Zeccanelli, um, I will start with you. Hi, my name is Sharon Zeccanelli. I live in Enosburg. Um, do you realize since Vermont has had a huge spike in COVID transmissions and we also have the highest um, vaccine rate, I think, in the country. Does this seem to make any sense to you? Does it? And the fact that you are wanting willingly to vaccinate the children is just beyond the scope of understanding. And maybe you just don't, maybe you don't follow Dr. Martin and the other scientists who aren't involved with Pfizer, Moderna, J&J. &J. They're actually just scientists on their own who are saying what's going to happen to the children. They're getting their shot, their vaccination. How many months, how many years will it be until they die because of the vaccination? And do you realize, somebody else mentioned it, that there are in fact aborted fetal cells in the vaccination. You can look that up yourself. Does not, does, does that not bother you? That's in it. So that's what I wanted to talk about with you tonight was about the vaccinations. I would like you to do some independent research if you could, if you felt like it was in your, the right thing for you to do. Do you know? Do you know what the vaccines do to people? I bet you every single one of you has had a vaccination. Have you? If you haven't had a vaccination, raise your hand. Nope, I bet not. Well, best of luck. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about was with the, about the vaccination and the children. God bless you all. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, James Clark, are you still with us? Yep, I'm still here. All right, feel free to um, share your thoughts. All right, um, so from the gentleman that spoke first, it sounds like there's some uh, CRT going on up there. Um, so I guess I'm a little confused on why you'd want kids to judge each other on their skin color or anything like that. I'm just kind of kind of stumped on that you know when I was a kid I would I would literally play with any kid because I'm a kid I'm not looking at their skin color I'm saying man this person's fun to hang out with I just that's one thing that stumps me is why you'd want to push something like that on our kids um the other thing is and I've asked this question quite a few times but I've never gotten an answer no one's ever been able to give me an answer and I've really appreciate it if i'd get an answer why 
why is it only with abortions it's my body my choice when it has to deal you're you're taking life at that point because i mean I, i'm religious so my my belief is is at conception that's that's life that's where life starts not when you have a heartbeat not when it's coming out right at conception so why is it my body my choice for something like that but when it comes to jabbing someone with something you don't even know what's in in it why is that not applied there i'm just i'd like an i'd like an answer from someone on why that doesn't apply james and i'm assuming this is probably not public comment and so we are not engaging in a debate around that topic but you're welcome to finish out your the rest of your you, an elected official, elected by the town of Enosburg, I'm asking you a question you should answer. I ran for state rep. I got all kinds of questions. I answered their question. I made time for people and did what I had to do. So people that when they voted for me, they knew they could come and ask me a question and I'd answer them. Or I'd go look into it and I'd say, you know what? I don't know right now, but I'll go look into it and I'll message you. I'll email you. I'll call you. Here's my number. If I don't get back to you, call me back. I just want to know why. What? I, I I know what the the game is behind these vaccines, but I just want to hear it. I want to hear you guys say it. And honestly, I'm trying to figure out a way. And I'd love to hand these out to every school board and superintendent, even principals. I'd like you guys to sign a contract stating that you guys are going to be liable for anything that happens to these students, whether it be a mask or the James, vaccine. James, thank you. Your time is up. Um, I, I haven't even talked anywhere near as long as anyone else. That was is this through, hitting a nerve? I'm I, just asking a question. Hey, that's not right. I'm Mary, timing. I have a timer here on my right, phone. Mary, he's you're, you're cutting me that's off right. and you're an elected official. So that goes, I, I don't know if you guys have adopted Robert's rules as your policy. We have. And but then I, I probably wouldn't break those rules. I gave you three minutes, actually more than three. No, I gave, you did no. Everyone I, else here has been talking, had like five minutes. James, what? I gave you the same amount of time. Jared went over a small bit. But that was it. He was the only one who went over by 20 seconds. I'm timing everyone. And where are you from, James? Are I am from Walden. And I suggest everyone in Enosburg, unseat these people. If you want the document, my email is vermonter01802 at gmail.com. I will forward you guys that document if you want to run against these people and unseat them. Get the evil out of our schools. And just remember this. James, you need you to school stop. Board member? No, I want to say one more thing. No, gonna your hear. time is up. I'm going to tell you at the end of all this, no one's getting out of here alive in this world. And James. in the end, every head will, every knee will bend and every head will bow. All right. <clears throat> Morgan, do we have anyone else in our virtual meeting that would like to talk? No new additions. No new additions. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to our uh, central office spotlights. And Jamie, you are up first. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, baby. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, I did just send out a new personnel list um, to each of you that you can review. It's quite lengthy, but it shows um, all the new employees, all the employees who have left and their replacements who have been hired that you can um, view. But I'll just give you a recap. Um, currently, we have hired 52 new professional staff members for this school year. And we've also hired 52 new support staff members for this school year. 
Um, this, these, in these numbers, in the last month, we have hired two additional teachers, one admin and eight support staff were included in those numbers. Um, in the last month though, we've also uh, lost four contracted teachers, uh, three resignations and unfortunately one death. Um, we've also had five paraeducators and one custodian resign and one custodian who switched districts. So we've, we've had quite a change even in the last month with employees. Uh, we currently have nine professional openings to fill and 12 support staff positions to fill. Um, this isn't included like substitutes, LEAPS instructors. Those are just um, permanent positions that we're looking for. Um, and then FMLA, uh, we've had 30 total requests for leave to date for this school year, um, 15 of which are for the birth of babies, um, and 13 of these leaves require a long-term licensed substitute teacher. This is an increase of nine requests just in the last month. So we have a lot of staff who are taking some time off. Um, we're having a very hard time finding subs, especially licensed to long-term subs. And for a couple of these leaves, we've actually had to, we, we couldn't find someone. So they've filled them with existing teachers who have free prep or lunch periods that they can fill in. Um, so that's putting some stress on our existing staff. We've also seen an increase in requests for the use of sick day donations um, to staff who've exhausted all of their own accrued leave. So staff are allowed to donate up to two days to each other for a qualifying FMLA event that's written into the master agreements. Um, and for staff who've participated in the old sick banks, um, they are allowed to donate their two days from that bank first. And we still have days remaining in most of those banks from 2018. Um, so um, currently we've, I've applied for 32 provisional licenses and two emergency licenses for teachers this school year. Um, this includes four additional provisional license, provisional licenses in the last month. And 2022 license renewals will be sent out to teachers in January. Um, I've sent a renewal list of 73 teachers with licenses that will be expiring on June 30th, 22 to the relicensing board. All teachers must submit professional development hours to this board prior to submitting their renewal application. And this is a lower number than we saw last year, um, about 25 lower, but that's because this last year was the last cycle of seven-year teacher licenses that ended on June 30th, 2021. So all level one licenses are valid for three years and all level two licenses are valid for five years now instead of seven. We have two deadlines that will be coming up. Um, teachers who plan to make column movement for the 22-23 school year are due to the central office by December 1st. And any union employees who plan to retire on June 30th 22 must submit a letter to central office by December 1st of 2021. Um, that's to be eligible for any retirement benefits. Um, that's $25 a day for any unused sick personal or CTO time for all staff. And for teachers, uh, one retirement benefit is $125 per year of service for 15 or more years. And the $25 a day is for anyone that has worked for us for 20 years or longer. 
um, open enrollment paperwork I sent out to employees on November 5th. Um, this is due back at the end of next week for any changes they'd like to make for January 1st. Um, there was no changes to the licensed employee contribution. They currently contribute 20% of the monthly premium. Um, no change to non-licensed school year employees who already contribute 80%. Um, but year-round non-licensed employees will be required to pay an additional 2% in contributions effective January 1st per the statewide health agreement. Um, we currently have 190 employees who take the silver plan with an HSA, and we currently have 113 employees who take the gold CDHP plan with an HRA. Um, and the statewide health care agreement is currently being negotiated for the next round of 2023 to 2025. It's a three year agreement. Um, the unresolved issue is the out of pocket cost share of the HRA and HSA contributions. The employee proposal is proposing a small decrease in HRA money for licensed employees only. And the employer proposal is proposing a small decrease in HSA money for licensed employees, but a large decrease in HSA money for all school employees. So that would affect two thirds of our employees. Um, so that's pretty much it for my update and spotlight about personnel. Does anyone have any questions? I just threw a lot of numbers at you. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, can you say the HS, what was the HSA thing again? Say that so, again. So currently about two thirds of our employees take the silver plan with an HSA. They're only allowed an HSA with the silver plan. So since we offered that for the first three years, a lot of our employees have banked up money so they wanna keep it. Um, but with the new statewide health care agreement, they're proposing for the next three years that it's a, the employer proposal is proposing a large decrease in HSA money to the employees. They want, basically, they want employees to go with the gold and take the HRA. The, we were, that's, the, that's the employer side that's doing that, or is that the employee side? No, the employer side okay. of the proposal. Any other questions? Thanks, Jamie. I appreciate it. I know it's it's a heavy lift, super complicated. We're lucky to have you at the helm of all that HR stuff. Appreciate it so much. Well, thank you. And I can send this um, report out to you if you want to look at all of these numbers. That'd yeah, be that would be great. Jamie, I know I talk to you about these things all the time, but I think just seeing the numbers helps to um, paint the picture of the kind of staffing challenges that we've been dealing with, with um, without the workforce behind some of these challenges to help us to really problem solve. So thank you for putting it into context for us to really be able to see what it is um, with our current reality. Great. And Rick, to, um, to answer your implied question there, um, the negotiations are at the point where both sides have given their um, best and final offer and the arbiter is going to need to choose one or the other in its entirety. So this is the point where the two sides are, um, they're making their pitch to that, that board of arbiters. Um, and so that's why they're kind of both at the last minute moving a little bit to the center. Um, thanks again, Jamie. Appreciate it. Uh, so, Jody, you're up next with the spotlight. Okay, thank you. It's actually um, Michelle Taburge and me together. Yeah, I saw that on your on the slides. Yeah, great. Yes. So we started doing that a couple of years ago, and you'll hear a little bit more about why. Um, and Michelle Irish was going to share her screen. We have some slides for you, and she was going to kind of drive the slideshow for us. 
All righty. Yeah. All right. So, yep, we can move on to the second one. Yep. One more. There you go. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So this is Act 173, which we've talked a little bit to you about previously, was developed as a result of two studies that were conducted based on the need for effective, available, and equitable services throughout our schools. The work happening since 2018 has been setting us up for this change. So collaboration between general education and special education is critical, and that is why this is a joint presentation. With this shift to Act 173 came the MTSS system, or what we also call the drivers. This is a multi-tiered system of approach. It is a framework in which we use data to problem solve and make decisions to support students. And the levers that you see here were identified by the Agency of Education as the critical shifts needed in order to implement an effective multi-tiered system of support. And then down at the bottom is um, a reference to the pandemic response plan that we developed last spring. And that was meant also to consider Act 173 implementation as we were also considering um, what education would look like post pandemic. Um, so we were meant to consider Act 173 implementation because that strong system of supports that Act 173 requires, they're needed now more than ever. So effective MTSS systems starts with effective universal instruction for academics and social emotional learning skills, such as emotional self-regulation, the executive function skills that students use to manage longer projects or when they have multiple classes with different teachers. Within the classroom setting, some students will receive double dosing of the standard that they are not currently proficient in. This is in addition to the regular lesson and it's for students who may need more time and support to learn the standard. Then there's intensive specialized instruction, and this will be offered in addition to the first instruction and double dosing opportunities, working on at a level standards that are not yet met. This is for students who have not responded to the universal instruction, double dosing, or interventions put in place. Students are identified for this level instruction from progress monitoring data, and then the most qualified teacher will deliver the instruction. So it's about matching the most skilled individuals with the specific needs of the students. So this slide is back to those levers that were identified by the Agency of Education. And the language in this slide actually came from the technical guidance documents that were issued by the Agency of Education uh, to help us understand these levers as we are implementing Act 173. Um, so we have been working to make these shifts since the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, the pandemic has slowed things down slightly just in the sense of, for example, with coordinated curriculum, uh, it's important for teachers to participate in that work and um, our opportunities to meet with them has been a little more limited with the pandemic. Um, but we still are on this path and we still are doing this work and have been since the 2018-19 school year. So these again are the pandemic response plan investment strategies. So we were given the three buckets by the agency of education that we needed to address in our pandemic response plan. Um, and you can also see some of the investment strategies that were associated with that. As mentioned earlier, MTSS is a framework for meeting academic and social emotional needs by using data-driven interventions. It's a more comprehensive approach to student learning. It supports a system level approach for allocating resources, professional development, and more. The Agency of Education put out an updated MTSS field guide in 2019 that presented a layered or leveled system framework. All students receive effective first instruction. Some students also get a double dose of grade level learning if they need additional time and support. 
And some students also receive targeted intervention to backfill gaps from previous grade levels. And then a few students receive intensive intervention. The next slide will show a graphic representation of this idea. So one of the changes in the MTSS 2019 update was um, the idea that it's levels or layers in the framework rather than tiers. And there was an emphasis that all students receive levels one and two in the classroom. So the universal instruction of grade level standards for all students, and then the double dose um, of those grade level standards as needed. And then students also receive levels three, four, five, in addition to levels one and two. It's both and rather than either or. So it is important that educators know their role within an effective MTSS system. Um, intervention starts in the classroom and is provided by the classroom teacher. And that's an important concept as we shift to Act 173. Interventionists collaborate with the teachers to provide targeted out of level instruction that really gives students the skills needed to access the grade level learning. And then special educators collaborate with classroom teachers to increase student access to grade level instruction by designing learner profile based accommodations and providing specialized instruction. And then paras should act as independent facilitators prompting and cueing students so they can apply their knowledge and use resources to manage their own learning. So on this slide, we're actually going to tag in Lynn and Morgan a little bit to talk through some of the funding changes. So I'll start. And um, one of the changes on Act 173 funding, the major change is that we're moving to what's called a census block funding formula. And so going forward, um, once this is fully rolled out, we will um, basically get a flat dollar amount per child um, across the SU, whether they're on an IEP or not. So our roughly 2,000 kids in our SU will generate a certain amount of money to be spent um, on you know, what traditionally is considered to be special ed. In the past, um, the funding model looked very different. Uh, and I should say in the past and in the current, um, we get what's called the mainstream block grants. And if that block grant comes into the supervisor union at say $600,000, we spend that $600,000 on special ed. And then we have to match it with $400,000 of local money and then um, anything that we spend above that million dollars um, is matched um, basically at a roughly a 55% share from the state. In this model, this current model, districts also can draw down that 55% match um, for special ed paraeducators only. Going forward, that piece of the match is gonna go away and it will be a, a flat dollar amount that comes to the SU and um, we will need to spend um, within that block grant, um, anything above that will, um, will be local funding. Um, for those of you who've been doing these budgets for a while, there is also a provision for when an individual child costs a significant amount of money for special ed services. Um, we see that uh, most often when kids are going out of district to, um, to a placement outside of our SU. Um, in that case, we will still get some of that um, extraordinary reimbursement. And um, I think this year, once we hit 65,000 for an individual kid, we're getting 90% of any dollars spent on top of that. That factor will, um, will still be in place in some version in the Act 173 model. Um, the second section of this slide is referring to the pupil waiting study. Um, the legislature um, commissioned a study a few years back to look at the formula that is behind the equalized pupil number. And again, that's one of the four figures that um, sets the tax rate um, for each of the districts each year. Um, 
currently that model gives um, higher or lower weights to different ty types of kids. So um, high school kids get a higher weight than elementary school kids. Pre-K kids get a lower weight. Um, students who are English language learners who, or who are coming from poverty or um, who are on IEPs get a slightly higher weight. Um, what this study did was basically say that while it is correct to, to assign different weights, you know, based on the, the challenges or the costs um, associated with educating different kids, um, the model that we've been operating under in Vermont has really not been based on any evidence. And they did some research and they've proposed a, um, a radically different weighting for some of those categories. Um, this is currently in the lap of a study committee of the legislature. Um, they're supposed to be submitting a report with recommendations in December. Um, my understanding is that they're not gonna hit that deadline. Lynn may have different information on that. Um, and the, the work of this committee um, seems to be um, dealing with how they are going to um, cope with the fact that some districts are going to be quote unquote losers while some districts are going to be quote unquote winners. And I don't know if you want to jump in on any more on that. I think you did a great job summarizing that. I mean, I think that as you can imagine, when there's a funding formula change that's going to impact people in that way of, you know, the perception, the goal is about creating more equitable opportunities for all of Vermont students. Um, but what's going to end up happening is that there will be uh, communities that come out on the losing end, as Morgan described. And so, as you can imagine, there's some pressure around timeline and about the process for how to make this shift to this kind of a funding um, method that they're having to contend with right now in the study committee. And at this point, it looks like um, we have been underserved by the old model, um, both of our two districts. And so um, uh, at this point, at least, we would be a quote unquote winner district. Um, there is about a three year phase in process um, that uh, until we get to the, the full census block funding and there are certainly gonna be some hiccups and some districts um, that even though they are ultimately gonna benefit may um, see some decreased funding in the short term as we move towards that. I do want to say one more thing, Morgan. This is something that for board members who have been on for a while, we started talking about with you at least two years ago um, when Act 173 was passed. And you know, the idea is to um, use those weights to right size the opportunities for students. So acknowledging that it costs more to educate certain students. So English language learners, for example, there are more services and supports that those students need. Um, and if, if our goal is really about equity and all means all, all students um, proficient, then we need to do what we need to do to make all students have the appropriate level of supports and opportunities. Um, there's, it's also you know, proven that it costs more to educate students who are economically disadvantaged or students who have an IEP. Um, so I think that one of the things to just be mindful of is this is, this is about creating if you know you fall into that. I don't like to use those terms to describe the winners and losers idea, but if you do fall into that category where you're gonna have some additional revenue available to your system, the goal that we talked about a couple of years ago is to, to use that revenue strategically to make a real difference for the students that you're serving. So I just wanted to, to put that reminder out there as well. And I think, Michelle, you have this last box on this slide. Yep, I'm actually going to talk about it in the next couple, two slides okay. from now. So you can head on to the next slide, Michelle. Well, that's better. I think we can go to the next one. We talked about, Morgan just talked about that one. So in addition to the changes with Act 173, after public comment, the legislature is also making changes to eligibility related to specific learning disabilities. 
So we currently use a discrepancy model. This means that we compare cognitive scores to achievement scores. And if the gap is wide enough, we say that there's a disability. Well, beginning in July of 2022, we will use our MTSS systems and we will determine eligi eligibility by using progress data and fidelity checks with our coordinated curriculum. So there will still be what we call the three gates to qualify for special ed, but we're, we will now as a school team determine what is the uniqueness of the learner that creates a barrier to their access of learning what impact is that having? And then have we exhausted all of our MTSS system? And is the student requiring a different approach to address those barriers? Whoops, sorry. Um, so one, some things have accelerated actually recently. Um, and we have been able to get at some things more quickly than we had anticipated. So within a, an MTSS system that's highly effective, your universal instruction, that first instruction that all students receive in the classroom from the classroom teacher is 80% effective. So 80% of the students are able to learn um, what they need to learn. And so some of the steps that we have been able to accelerate, for example, is to use ESSER money to purchase um, some more common instructional resources. So we've been using foundations uh, for a while, uh, since before 2006. And um, because the materials had been in use for that long, some of them had, um, you know, worn out essentially. And so we were able to replace those materials and also ensure that all of our teachers receive professional learning from the Stern Center for Language and Learning to make sure that all of our teachers are teaching foundations very effectively. Um, also, we were able to provide some professional learning with ESSER money as well, so that all of our teachers of math um, are getting to work with um, experts from the All Learners Network focused on our math priority standards and highly effective instruction. And then also our content teachers, so our middle and high school teachers and our unified arts teachers um, are getting to choose from a few different topics to, to dive deeply into um, one per year. And universal design for learning is one of those. Um, and that is meant to make our universal instruction more effective by planning for learner variability from the very beginning. And what else has accelerated? Um, we have been able to purchase um, EduClimber, which is a platform to um, house our data to be able to track student performance. We also have been able to offer professional development around progress monitoring and learning how to conduct student interviews to ask questions to get at the root cause and then um, determine what specialized instruction and interventions we need to put into place um, from those root cause analysis. So I actually just already spoke about this one. <laughs> so this is a, the same thing that I talked about, the literacy foundations, the all out learners network, and then the universal design. So what are your questions? So I guess I have one question. When we talk about, I think it was the second gate, it was like basically part of the MTSS system where um, you have to demonstrate that this the needs aren't being met within that system. Um, does that mean, are, are we adequately, adequately staffed with interventionists throughout our, throughout our buildings? Not yet. <laughs> we're having a hard time. You know, one of the things that Jamie reported out on was that we have a number of openings still, and we're finding that to be an incredibly challenging position to fill. We would love to see more interventionists in our buildings, um, and we'll continue to look for them. We're also going to be responsible for doing fidelity checks with the first instruction and the agency is supposed to put out some guidance around that like what what does that mean and what does that look like and so that's coming well so that was i guess another that leads to another question is what kind of 
you know, um, what kind of checks, I guess, will be done if, if in fact, you know, we, we can't fill these, or any school can't fill some of those po positions, but yet they're on the hook to use them. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just curious of if, if what's the, what's the mechanism? It's gonna, we're gonna go back to the first instruction, like 80% need to, of needs of students and have to be proficient within that first instruction. And then really looking at that 20% but I agree. I'm not, I'm not sure what those tools are going to be yet. I just have a question around um, like establishing eligibility um, to be on an IEP or this specific program from what I'm understanding, you're gauging that differently. Um, so does that mean you won't be using uh, school psychologists or specialists to, to gauge IQ or to diagnose ASD? Is, is that changing? That that part won't change as far as we'll still need the cognitive profiles to be able to understand how to program for students. Um, what is changing is it's really, once a student has a disability, it's we're going a specific learning disability, then they already have adverse effect, like that gate is met. So then we go to, is there need for specialized instruction? Have we exhausted all of our MTSS systems? Gotcha. So it's really, it's really the adverse effect. We're, we're going to assume that they are having adverse effect if they have the disability. And within Act 173 and the funding and programming, is there anywhere that addresses um, kids who need opposite end of the spectrum and need enrichment? Yes, that's what our universal design, that first instruction is supposed to meet all students' needs. We're also working on strengthening our um, professional learning community processes. And that is one of the questions, the four questions in a professional learning community is what do we do when students have already learned it and need that um, acceleration? Okay, thank you. We've had that conversation before, Emily, that it, it is, we, the numbers are often higher with the students who are struggling to, to get to proficiency. And, you know, we, Historically, schools focus a lot of time and effort and resources on how do we respond when kids don't learn, right? And that's fundamentally what the MTSS systems have focused on traditionally. But Jody is exactly right, and so is Michelle, that the, the work around the PLC, they're, they're supposed to be focused in on identifying the what to do when they already know it in advance of the learning. And that shift to pre-assessment really is a mind shift too. So that's one of the big things that we're working on this year is really thinking about how do we effectively pre-assess and establish what students do already know so that we can use their time to accelerate their learning. Thank you. Great, thank you both so much. That was excellent, incredibly thorough. I appreciate that strong, um, that strong work, it's, it's great. And Emily, I like your co-pilot there. <laughs> Making great, great faces for giving the us a wave. <laughs> um, so uh, we had a quick need actually uh, to um, reprioritize the order and move Lynn ahead of Morgan. Um, so uh, if that's all right, Morgan, we're going to bump you and let Lynn go ahead right now with her uh, superintendent report. Thank you. I apologize as my I was looking at my battery and realizing I left my charger at the fire station this morning. So uh, if I happen to drop off, not yet, Morgan, um, not quite ready for that yet. Uh, but if I happen to drop off, I'm going to jump onto my phone to so just go ahead and move to Morgan um, and then I'll come back on as soon as I can. So I'm going to start out with personnel. Uh, I'll be ready at the end of personnel, Morgan, to shift to that slideshow. So we have some personnel for you to approve in terms of hiring. So we have hired Emily Richard as a special educator and Vernon Boom, Boom I'm not going to say it right, Hoover? Oh, Hoover. Boom Hoover. Boom Hoover, our facilities director, our first FNESU facilities director. 
along with Sonia Lacrosse, who is a gonna be replacing Roxanne Tanner's uh, role in the central office as bookkeeper. So I would ask the board for a motion to approve uh, hiring. I'll move. Thanks, Polly. By roll, Emily. Aye. Rick. Aye. Kat. Aye. Polly. Aye. And Mary is an aye. Morgan, we still don't have Kevin, eh? Correct. Okay, great. So I do have um, a resignation, um, don't need action on it because it's actually a breaking contract. So I would not ask you to approve that. Nicole Horgan, a speech and language pathologist um, has chosen to, to take another position. And we also, um, this isn't a resignation, but we had a interventionist working at Berkshire Elementary who passed away tragically in a car accident, Mark Van Buren. Um, so, so we are, we have an open position at Berkshire Elementary, sadly. Um, in terms of retirement, we don't have anything to report to you yet. As Jamie said in her board report, the December 1st deadline is, is coming up quickly and we're starting to get a lot of notifications around column movement and starting to see some in terms of retirement. So we'll report out in December on that. I'm not going to read all of the, well, maybe I, maybe I should in case someone's watching our board board meeting. Um, we have several open positions throughout the SU. We're looking for special educators, an early childhood special educator, board certified behavior analyst, an EST coordinator, speech and language pathologist, um, English language learner teacher, middle school reading specialist, literacy interventionist, math interventionist, occupational therapist, assistant, kitchen assistant, a cert certified tutor, LEAPS instructors, and substitutes for teaching, nursing, paraeducators, custodian, and food service. So Polly, that kind of answers your question about do we have enough of the interventionists? As you can see, there's a pile of, pile of those positions in there. I do have one other thing under personnel, but that's going to need to be an executive session. So I'm wondering, Mary, could we take that up at the end? so that we don't have to keep all of the administrators on. It won't, I won't need anyone in that except Morgan. Yeah, absolutely, that's fine. Okay, Morgan, you can, you can put the slideshow on. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about COVID-19 uh, COVID updates and context. So as many of you know, we began our test to stay program um, last Tuesday. So the way it works, if you're identified as a close contact, if somebody has um, been near someone who's positive for COVID and there's been an exposure, the state does not require that um, vaccinated individuals have to quarantine, but unvaccinated individuals do have to quarantine. So until we got to the place where we've been able to um, have the test to stay option, students haven't been able to come to school. Can you change the slide, Morgan? So now that we're in the test to stay program, we've been able to see quite a few families take advantage of it. This is definitely something that parents have to volunteer for. They sign their children up online, they complete paperwork, um, and then they drive their students to a test to stay site. We did a response site in Sheldon in that first week because they had a lot of cases that week. Um, as those, the number of close contacts in Sheldon started to, to come down as students reached their seven day mark, we shifted that to the Richford site. And our intention had been from the beginning to run those two sites in our most centralized communities. So one in, in Richford and one in Enosburg. Um, and that's been working pretty well. We started in, in Richford, I'm sorry, in Enosburg last Friday. So, so far, um, we are uh, now in day, I think we just finished day seven of our test to stay program and we have conducted 532 rapid antigen tests. Uh, out of those, we have found seven additional positive cases. Um, we have, we have several staff members who have volunteered to work the test to stay program. It is um, an early morning, we start at 6.30 and we are done testing at 7.45 each morning. Um, super appreciative of the people who have volunteered to help with this program. It's the, a program that Vermont is offering, uh, modeled after a program that Massachusetts has been using for a while now. Um, and what 
Secretary French has communicated to us is that it appears that there is an interest really across the country and more um, states participating in this test to stay so that we really can maximize the, the ability for students to stay in school, even if they're identified as a close contact. Um, we have seen some parents be reluctant to test, which is fine, that's their choice. Um, they do have to quarantine if they don't do the test to stay. Next slide. We did have our first vaccination clinic last week, I believe it was Friday at Enosburg um, in the Vermont Department of Health. These are Vermont Department of Health clinics, we're giving them spaces. Uh, these are pediatric only vaccination clinics for children ages five through 11. We have three additional uh, clinics, Richford Elementary, Berkshire and Sheldon. Uh, for these clinics, I just wanna be really clear, uh, no students attend these clinics without parents' uh, consent. We actually require that parents come and attend with their child for the clinic. So we're not bringing any students down to be vaccinated. I wanna be really clear, there are misconceptions still about that. Next slide. I know that all of you receive a lot of emails from us and have over the past three weeks. I would say that these past three weeks have been the, the most challenging three weeks since the start of the pandemic. Um, we saw on the week of um, the first week in November, last year, I believe the, the most cases we had in any one week happened in February last year, and we had 19 cases that week. The first week of November, we, uh, kind of broke that record so our highest case count was 25 that week. Last week we had 43 cases in FNESU which is now the the highest number we've had since the start of the pandemic. So we kind of freeze our data on Fridays usually around four or five in the afternoon so any cases that come late Friday night um, into the following Friday um, are counted towards the next week. So for this week so far we're on Wednesday and we've had 23 cases so far this week. So that brings our total in FNESU to 173 cases. And as you can see, I don't have a bar graph for this week. That'll be reported out on Friday. We'll have new information about that. But you can see that we have a, a couple of communities that have had more cases than others. And what we're seeing, uh, you know, meet with the nurses every week. And what we're seeing is the pattern is kind of shifting. So sometimes we'll see a couple weeks where the school will be hit harder with cases and then those will start to wane and then another school will be hit harder with cases. So what we've seen over the course of the last three weeks are higher cases at Sheldon, uh, Richford Elementary, Richford High School. This week we're starting to see some of those cases coming down uh, at Richford, Richford High School in particular and we're seeing more cases kind of spike up at Berkshire Elementary and Enosburg Elementary. So um, that is, has become kind of a full-time job for many of us to, to just track and communicate about the, the positive cases that we have. So it's something that we promised our community we would do at the start of this. So we're continuing to do that. So in terms of um, patterns with the data, uh, next slide, Morgan. I'm gonna talk a little bit about transmission patterns. So. We have seen that there have been some positive cases that have come as a result of exposures in the school. Um, however, the majority of the cases we're seeing still appear to be more about community transmission. So more about the, the virus transmitting within families or in gatherings outside of school. So what we noticed with that data is that greater than 80% of the positive individuals that we've had so far and if any issue have been unvaccinated and more than 40 of the positive individuals were, um, were age eligible for, were age eligible and unvaccinated. More than 80 of the positive indiv individuals were not age eligible. So they were younger than 13. And those were unvaccinated individuals because they, they weren't eligible yet. A little more than 10% of the positive individuals in FNESU have been in vaccinated individuals. Um, so in summary, our data does indicate that the spread of the virus is primarily in unvaccinated individuals at this time in FNESU. So next slide. 
in terms of mitigation measures, um, I know that there are differing opinions about a lot of things that are centered around COVID. We continue to follow the recommendations that are coming from the public health uh, experts at the Vermont Department of Health and the epidemiological experts um, as well, along with the Agency of Education. So we are masking, we're cleaning, uh, we're distancing to the extent possible. Uh, we're trying to, to limit more of the mixing of students. We were very strict about mixing students last year and part of our guidance was around potting and students couldn't, couldn't mix from one class into another classroom. We haven't had to do that this year. With a number of increased cases that we've been experiencing in the last three weeks, we're doing a little more of that limiting. So if we don't have to mix for something, like we're, we're not gonna put two classes together to do a project right now. It doesn't seem like a, a good idea until we can get those case counts back down. We're still really relying upon uh, seating assignments so that we can, we can track um, who was near a positive individual when we have cases. One of the other mitigation measures is around contact tracing. So when there is someone who um, does test positive, we do the work to try to identify who meets the criteria for becoming a close contact to that positive individual. So that alone takes a tremendous amount of work in our schools. It's, it falls heavily on our school nurses who are um, working um, an unimaginable amount of, amount of hours right now to try to work through this. It's also falling heavily on our principals as well. Another mitigation measure that we have is our test to stay program, which I already described as a, it's a brand new um, piece that we've put in and uh, state vaccination clinics, just hosting those in our schools so that they're accessible for families. Um, in terms of ventilation, we have worked on improving ventilation in our buildings. We've spent more than $400,000 already in improvements and there is more to come. As we reported in our, um, in my hiring update, we have Vern Boom, Boomhover, who is going to be starting um, next week or the week after, I think it might be the week after. And one of the things we're gonna ask Boom to real, um, Vern to really real, um, lean into is, we just did an assessment to identify what are the additional needs that we have around our ventilation systems. So he's gonna be working on that. Next slide. I apologize for the dog. Um, the next slide is around staffing capacity. So I think that one of the things I want you to hear as a board, um, and I know I've said this to you before, our staff is, incredible. They're very dedicated. They have, you know, the needs of the students clearly in mind and they're working so hard. I can't describe how hard they're working. We're feeling that our capacity is, we're kind of exceeding our threshold, our capacity right now around contact tracing in particular. I just kind of created a list of the things that are really putting pressure on our system. Um, some of the things that are required of nurses around line lists. Hold on one second. The line lists are taking quite a bit of time. Um, the test to stay program that, that we're, we're doing is taking um, work at all levels. And I think that one of the things we didn't anticipate is how much work it was going to cause the nurses to track for us who those close contacts are in our schools because we need to have that every morning to know who's eligible for the program. So I think that, you know, that's something I certainly didn't anticipate. Um, and what we saw this morning when we opened up that close contact list was that we had more than 300 students on it. Um, I think we're down into the mid 200s at the end of the day today. So some of those kids have um, gone beyond their seven days and tested out. The pandemic response, the um, it's still happening, whether, people want to talk about it or, or believe it or not, the pandemic is still happening and the, we're at the point where the, if the highest number of infections on our daily averages are, are higher than they've been since the start of the pandemic. And certainly we're seeing that in our schools as well. So at the same time that we're focusing on pandemic response, we also have all of these requirements and responsibilities around the pandemic recovery. 
So we're trying to find that balance because our staff doesn't have the capacity right now to take on all that we had hoped that we could accomplish this year um, as, as was identified in our pandemic recovery plan uh, because we're, we're really spending a lot of our, our time, resource and energy still responding. Um, I think that everyone hoped, I think back to late July when things started to take a turn for the worse. I think we all were really hoping and no, we all were really hoping for a very different year. Um, we, we had plans for a very different year and those plans are still there and we're ready to lean back in um, to those plans as soon as, as soon as things settle down. As Jamie reported in her uh, report, we're still contending with a pretty high number of uh, staffing shortages. We have third, um, sorry, 21 openings still. And uh, we know we have more that we're gonna have to be looking for because we have 13 of those FMLA positions that are gonna require licensed long-term substitute teachers. So we're gonna be contending with that and trying to find people to come, to come work. And we're struggling with that right now. And that's something that's common across the state. We're still looking to onboard substitute teachers. That's um, with the number of absences. That's something that the principals and, and the staff are dealing with on a daily basis is figuring out how to kind of divide and cover uh, because we are not able to find substitutes for the number of people who are out each day. So that continues to be a struggle. We're also seeing higher levels of challenging student behaviors in our schools. And that's something I think I'm sure that if, if you've been watching, you've seen it on the news, it's something that people are seeing across the country in terms of the social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students have, they've intensified during the pandemic. Um, and we've also seen a much higher level of challenging adult interactions as well. We're, we're seeing you know, our, our nurses and our principals and other leaders contending with a lot more um, people with, I guess I would describe it as shorter fuses now. And I understand it. I completely understand it. People are, are fed up. They want the pandemic to be over. We all want the pandemic to be over. What's happening is that that is presenting itself in a way that is causing people to la lash out at our staff members, which is, is making the work even more challenging than it already is. So um, I just would ask that people recognize and understand that, you know, everybody is doing the best that they can during this time period and, you know, trying to be open to working together as we navigate the end of this pandemic, which we all hope is just ahead. Um, are there any questions on that or do you want me to shift into hiring? So I will, I'm going to turn this a little bit over to Morgan. So I didn't know uh, Morgan or Mary or Rick, do any of you want to say anything about the facilities director or just, you know, acknowledge that we're excited to have Vern on board um, and that, you know, we had a process that resulted in us finding a bookkeeper that we're really excited about as well. And if anybody wanted to add to that. Yeah, I'll just say, I think they're both going to be great hires. Um, Sonia is not going to start with us until January, um, but we will, uh, we're glad to take her at that point uh, as well. And I think she's going to be a good fit. Um, Vernon is starting earlier. Um, he comes with a lot of experience from Polly's district from many years back, um, as well as um, doing similar work for NCSS. Um, and so he's somebody who is going to be able to really hit the ground running with this position that's new to us? Um, asked a lot of great questions in the um, the interview process, and I think um, I think he's going to be able to look at some of the the work, some of the research that that Lynn tipped. We, we had Efficiency Vermont come in and look at all our buildings, um, and obviously throughout the last two years, the the head custodians in each building have been looking at the needs through COVID eyes. Um, we've got a couple of projects that he's going to be able to jump right in on and um, and help us improve. And I think um, hopefully he's going to be um, a good long-term match for us and really um, give our buildings the 
attention that they need. Yeah, so I can speak. I have worked with Vern and he is um, he's a team player for sure. Um, super knowledgeable. So I'm I'm we're lucky to have him, I feel. I echo that, Polly. Um, I've worked with him in the past. And when I saw his name on that list, I was like, oh, please. <laughs> That's great to hear. That's all I have. Mary, I don't have anything under other. We'll just need to circle back for the executive session. Hey, Lynn, I do have uh, just two quick questions for you. Of, okay. of those seven positive uh, that you did with the rapid test, were they all confirmed with PCR? So they um, do not need to, with the test to stay, confirm with PCR. So I don't know if some of them chose to or not, but it isn't part of the test to stay that they must confirm. Okay, so um, so they're presumptive. So you treat them as a positive then? Yes. Can you can can you ask what the uh, specificity is on that test? So in terms of it, it being a screener instead of diagnostic, is that what you're asking? Yeah. So, I mean, if it's 99% specific, right, mm -hmm. it's going to pop positive one out of every 100 tests, whether or not you're infected or not. Mm -hmm. So if you test 530 students, you expect five to be positive. But I don't know if it's actually greater than 99. I don't know where. I, mean, I, can, I can check that. We had this conversation with... Um, I'm trying to, I think it might've been BDH and AOE the weekend before we were trying to make sure that we had all of our T's crossed and I's dotted in terms of how this program works, because like I said, this is a new program to all of us. So, um, yeah. And what I'm, what I'm worried about is that your predictive value of that test is actually really low. So your positive predictive value of that test really depends on the chances of a student uh, who is identified as a close contact, you know, within school uh, turns up positive. And if that chance is actually really low, like a lot of people think that it is, the value of that test, uh, I question the value of that test, but I'm making assumptions to make that assessment. And I'm not sure that those assumptions are correct. You know, in uh, swapping devices, we can certainly uh, look into that and get back to you. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm hoping one of the nurses knows, but we can figure that out. Okay. Um, Lynn, so I had a clarification then just off of what Rick, I mean, Rick, I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly. Are you concerned about false positives? Yeah. So, yeah. And so false positives. So if you have uh, a, a large, you know, if you have a lot of uh, if you have a lot of people that actually have the disease and you're testing for them, you know, the predictive value of that test goes, uh, of a positive test goes very high. But if you're testing a population that actually has a very low level of, of uh, chance of being infected, then the positive value of that doing that test goes down pretty dramatically. And so, you know, we're putting a lot of resources into, you know, into administering this test. And if we're really, you know, getting a fair number of false positives, then running the test may actually not be worth it, if that makes any sense to you. I think I, I just want to caution. I, sorry, I had to switch to my phone. I understand the question and I'll go ahead and, and get that information. Um, I have a contact with the Department of Health that I could reach out to and our nurses might know this either. I just don't want us to assume that we are getting false positives because um, I don't, I, I'll ask the question, but I just, I wanna cautious, caution us from assuming that. Okay, and I was also under the impression that they were, they wanted people to confirm with a, with a PCR, but like apparently that's not the, Correct. So for take homes, yes, but because they're identified as close contacts in the test to stay, I wonder if that increases the um, the predictive value because they're already a population that's had an ex a known exposure. Well, so that's so. what I think that I think that that is, I think that is also they're trying to increase that predictive value, and I think they also tried to increase the predictive value when they changed the definition of close contact. 
to the three feet? To the three feet. But I would really like to know those numbers. Okay, I can get that for you. Um, and so Lynn, I have a question. If someone in the test to stay program tests positive, and they were to go get a PCR test, would that overrule the positive rapid antigen test? And would they be allowed back at school or able to resume the test to stay program? So you're asking really great questions. Um, we would, in a, because we haven't had that situation yet, Mary, we would reach out to the VDH to give us guidance on what to do in that specific scenario. We find that it, they try to predict the scenarios that we're gonna have in this test to stay, but sometimes you end up with things that they haven't anticipated are going to happen. And then we find that when that happens, we just have to reach out and they give us guidance about how to handle those specific cases. Yeah, okay. Um, my other question is, Lynn, do you have any idea of the percentage of kids that have signed up for the test to say program or how many haven't, I guess is what I'm more worried about. Um, so it would be a little hard to get at that number because we've asked people to sign up in advance if they're interested in testing their student because what we've learned with the system is nobody wants to hang out in the line and um, wait at 6.30 in the morning. And what has happened, unfortunately, is they, the paperwork goes through, there's two parts of the permission. One is the consent, which goes through a database at the state level. And that database is only uploaded to us one time a day. So what we're finding is that, that families do that paperwork um, kind of the morning of or the night before. And so it doesn't show up in our system yet. So they're having to duplicate it. So if I were to try to figure out what's the end, what's the total number, of people, I, I would have to unpack that a little because some have already been doing it and some have signed up in advance. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, yes, I do. Um, yeah. But I will tell you there were, we're testing on average right now, the last, uh, Morgan can correct me, I think it's the last three days, we've been right around um, 100, just over 100 between the two sites. That is accurate, Lynn. Thank you, Robin. And to answer one of Rick's questions, um, I think you identified that we had seven positives. Uh, we know that one of those was confirmed with a PCR. We only know that because the family shared that information. I don't think it's information that the family has to share with the school, um, but we do know that the one test to stay that was positive was confirmed with a PCR. So I just thought I would elaborate on that for Rick. A lot of times the nurses have that information too, and that, that isn't always information that, that gets shared back out. All right, thanks. Lynn, do you have anything else other than the um, personnel issue we'll deal with uh, under board business? I do not. Okay, so um, Morgan, I'll jump back to you then. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do my, both the kind of normal regular agenda items first and then um, I'll, see how much time you want me to pick up in terms of the budget discussion. Um, so in your packet, I sent you the October financial report. Um, no real storm clouds in the horizon that I can see. I'm happy to try to answer any questions that anybody has on that. And then uh, we are expecting to see a draft of your audits start coming in um, sometime in December. Um, I think I've told you at your local level that uh, because of the coronavirus relief money that we got last year, all three of our districts, the SU and the, the two UUSDs, all of them need what's called a single audit, which is a deeper dive look at your federal funds. Um, so that may 
it means that the auditors are going to have to spend more time on those two UUSD books than they normally do. Um, skipping down to the bottom of my report, I sent in your packet the financial management questionnaire. Um, this is something that uh, business managers need to complete every year, and then they need to present it to the SU board, um, and you need to review it. Um, this changes very little from year to year. Um, again, it's basically sort of going through and um, answering questions about uh, our procedures in the back office. And I believe it's there to prevent um, me from stealing a bunch of money and then you guys being able to say that you had no idea how that could happen. Um, so basically it helps to put you on the hook for the um, financial uh, stability of the district. So I'm happy to, to answer any questions on that. Um, again, that did go out in your packet. And um, if you are okay with it, uh, at some point, I'm gonna want a motion uh, to authorize the board chair to sign the financial management questionnaire. I'll move. Thanks, Polly. By roll, Rick. Aye. Emily. Aye. Polly. Aye. Kat. Aye. And Mary is an I. Great, thank you. Um, the last thing that I want to cover, and I'm going to do some screen sharing here, um, is your FY23 first look at your budget. Um, I know that one of you has to leave in about 15 minutes, and so I'm happy to do this as a speed walk and then answer questions offline. Um, and maybe I'll do that. And if um, you want to dig deeper once Emily's gone, if we still have a quorum, um, I can do that if that makes sense. That sounds good, Morgan. Okay. So uh, what you should see on your screen now is something that um, hopefully looks familiar. This is sort of the 10,000 foot view of the FNESU budget. Um, I have not entered any figures for uh, last year's actual expenses or this year's to uh, through December 31st for the first half of the year, but um, those are things that I will um, have for you at some point in the, the process. Um, this, as usual for your first look at a budget is still very much in draft form. Um, there's still a lot of things that need to drop and before we can dial in the expenses. Um, but at first, I kind of want to walk you through some of the changes from last year in terms of how it's presented. Um, most are minor, but there are a few big ones. Uh, so similar to your, um, to your local budgets, uh, this will sort of follow the new state chart of accounts and walk you through the, the big sections um, of your general fund budget. And again, that's the only one that you guys will look at and approve, and then the budget that you approve sends the assessments to your local districts. So for the general fund, the, the first big section is um, kind of a broad category for regular education. Improvement of instruction is um, training teachers to be better teachers and doing curriculum work. So the work that Jody does is in this section. The work that Sharon Wright does, um, training up your new teachers is in this section. And then professional development for central office staff will fall under here. General administration is, uh, I think, what's traditionally lumped into the superintendent's office. So that would be Lynn and Courtney and Doreen in our office. It's also where we put most of the um, the normal expenses for central office, like um, insurances and supplies and things like that. School administration at the SU level is really specific to the administration of the early ed program. Um, so that's Melissa Wood and then um, the training and, and uh, supplies that she has for the early ed programs in our six elementary schools. Central services um, includes the business office, HR, and the um, 
the technology department has moved into this category now with the new chart of accounts. So Dominic and Thomas Wood are in this category, along with um, the large bill that we spend on software every year um, for running central office, but also that we um, buy on behalf of the schools, um, as well as um, the, the technology purchases that we make at central office. Operation of plant is where central office rent is included, um, but it's also where Vern's position is going to be housed um, going forward as we've now hired that at the SC level. Um, student transportation is the regular to and from transportation, moving kids from home to school and back again. Uh, food service is pulled out in its own section. Um, Below that is the special education section. The big number there for direct instruction are your special education teachers who, um, who are now paid, uh, have been paid for the last five to seven years out of the SU office uh, per state statute. Student support would be things like your SLPs, um, counselors, those folks who are under Michelle's budget. Um, improvement of instruction would be professional development for all of that staff, as well as your BCBAs come in there. Um, general administration, um, similar to what we have up above for central office, would be Michelle Robin, part of Doreen, and then some of the, um, the expenses like software that they purchase um, either for their department or for the special ed programs in all of the schools. And then student transportation is um, the cost primarily of moving students from our district to out of placement districts for those that are not um, receiving education in one of our schools. Um, lastly, we're pulling out the English language learners budget separately um, per, again, per the state's chart of accounts. I've also included two sections on this recap that traditionally have not been in your local budget. Um, the 21st century or the LEAPS program is the after school program and it's funded by several different pockets of money. One of them is um, money that's basically contributed by the two local districts. And in the past on your local boards, you've seen that as a a single line item. So it might be, you know, whatever the number is, $100,000 is going to support that program. At, um, at our level, we're actually uh, tracking specific expenses and then billing those back to you. So we're not just taking a donation from the school districts. We are going through and saying, okay, these are the expenses that are going to apply um, to that local share. And then um, we will subgrant those to the district as we go through the year. Um, so we need to track that, um, that at the SU level and technically that is part of the general fund budget. So next month when you see revenue, if this 222 number stays the same, you will see a line item for revenue for 222,000 and that's something that we pull out sort of apart from the normal assessment. And I'm seeing Polly nodding her head, so I'm assuming you guys are getting that. Yeah, I got that. But I do have one question. So if, if okay. any of that leaps happens to be grant funded, does the um, cost to the districts go down or do you just pop it into revenue? Or is any so of it? Much, yeah, much of that program is grant funded and Heather can tag in if I, I blow it in anything here. Um, what we do is throughout the year, we are um, we're pushing some of the costs to 21C, we're pushing some of the costs to CFP, the Consolidated Federal Programs, we're pushing some of this to, um, to this local pot of money, and then some of it to um, you know, miscellaneous grants that may come in. Um, there's actually a specific formula for the 21C grant where um, they can only fund a certain percentage of the program. So we are looking at that, um, Heather's looking at that on a regular basis and um, deciding where expenses need to go. Um, we've been moving 
specific things into this local budget piece because um, because it's not tied to any federal money. It's um, easier to spend in a way. There's um, it's fewer restrictions on procurement and on um, what what our people have to do to track their time. Um, so yeah, that whatever that number is, it's not doesn't mean that you're automatically going to pay that from the district if that's offset by local fundraising or if the program spends less money, um, you're going to be charged less money. And then lastly, this bill back local section um, at your district level, you have heard me talk about folks like the guidance counselor that Richford Elementary and Montgomery Elementary are sharing or the librarian that those two schools are sharing because that person crosses two districts. Um, we have to pay for them at the SU and then we just send you a bill for whatever those true costs are. Um, and we really should be showing this in our general fund as well. So again, if that 250,745 number doesn't change between now and, and when we show you revenue, you will see a specific amount of money coming into the districts to offset that. So that is um, speed round and I will come back to this in a moment. I'm gonna um, stop sharing and then reshare uh, something else that you see in your local budgets. I haven't brought anything in yet for you um, to look at. So this is your first look this year. Um, of the pie charts. So this is um, attempting to break up uh, your budget graphically to kind of show you where you're spending. And on this, this pie chart, I have not included those two bill back categories. So this is really only what we've traditionally called central office and assessed out. And I'm not sure if you can see, um, see my mouse, but, um, at uh, six o'clock to 10 o'clock, this big um, pink section is what you're spending on your special educators, um, which are uh, paid for by the SU, but obviously are in your buildings. Um, this yellow piece of the pie at four to six o'clock is the food service. Uh, right above that is transportation. Um, the section of blue lines from noon to about two is the, the different categories for, and you know, traditionally the superintendent's office. So um, that improvement of instruction, the curriculum work, uh, Lynn's work, and then the, the financial um, and human resources and technology piece. Um, and then uh, from 11 to 12 o'clock, let's say, are some of the smaller slices of pie for the, um, for the special ed program. Now, can you, are you back to seeing the red lines? Perfect. Um, so I'll leave this up here. Um, I'm gonna go through quickly um, the change in FTEs uh, from last year's budget to this year's budget, because as, um, as I've been harping on every year, really the bulk of the money that we spend is on people. So in terms of budget, the the traditional central office budget this year had 12.1 FTEs and this proposed budget in front of you has 13.0. Um, and so the movements on those are, um, Heather Moore has been uh, traditionally 0.2 in this budget. We have pulled her out of this budget um, and she is uh, gonna be completely funded by the 21C program. So that one day a week of fundraising that she's done or grant writing that she's done, um, we're gonna try to find among existing people. And that's really a driver of the demands of that after school program is really um, making it harder for her to, to put that level of effort into grant writing. Um, we have um, cut the early ed director from a 1.0 to a 0.8, so four days a week. She's actually, um, this is her first year. We were only able to hire her for three days a week. And so it's um, an increase in the amount of time she's actually spending, um, but 
in terms of the budget, it's a, a 0 0.2 decrease. And that's basically a function of the, the time that um, she's got available for us. And the plan is that eventually that will uh, move back to full time. Uh, we are proposing an increase in the ELL teacher. Um, traditionally, that's been a 0 0.2 position and kind of an appendage on somebody else's job who, who has those skills. Um, we've hired somebody this year who is dedicated to that totally. Um, they're actually working two days a week or we're paying them for two days a week. They're probably working more. And what we're finding is that they're identifying a lot more kids who are in need of these services. And so that's the drive of that going up to um, a full-time position. And then the last movement in this budget is um, we're proposing adding uh, only half of a full-time equivalent of Vern to this budget. Um, we're anticipating that because initially his focus is gonna be, um, his, maybe not wholly, but um, significantly on improving HVAC in our buildings and managing some of those projects and some of those grants that are coming down. Um, we think that we're gonna be able to justify funding him in part out of some of the ESSER money that uh, we receive. Um, so if we come to you by December and we've submitted the ESSER application and that um, has been rejected, we may bump this up to full time. Um, but the, the plan would be to kind of ease him into your local budget um, by using some of those grant funds to, to cover what I think is justifiable COVID work. So I'll pause there and see if there are any questions on that. Okay, in terms of food service, um, the big change in FTE there is um, that the employees who were Abbey employees in Sheldon and under that Sheldon contract are now your local employees. So they have been moved into your, um, to Don's local budget. Um, we are also putting in a to be hired position, um, one full time who would basically be uh, a substitute for that program. Uh, we found certainly this year that um, there isn't a day when we don't have somebody out. Um, a lot of times if we can't find someone, Don gets pulled into that. Um, and we, Don and I had a discussion and we decided we could either try to hire an, an actual person who we could move around as needed, or we would have to um, put in a substitute line um, for folks that were hiring at a one-off basis um, as there are needs in the buildings. So I think money-wise, it's probably would be roughly the same um, if we still see the absence patterns that we've been seeing. Um, you've got a little more, I think you've, you would have a better trained person and a little more stability if it's a you know, so-called permanent sub. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Um, so down at the bottom, ELL, I, I already tipped that, um, that change from a 0.2 to a, a 1.0. Um, in special education, um, there's, I think, a little bit more movement right now. Um, what I am seeing is budget to budget. I think we're going to be up 2.0 special educators. One of them will be in the program that we've discussed in the past, um, that sort of step up or step down program, trying to prevent um, losing some of these kids to out of district placements. Um, obviously we need staff to, to run that program and we've got um, planning on putting one person in there. Um, we also are seeing increased needs in Berkshire Elementary. Those caseloads have always been um, on the high end and we're proposing a, a 1.0 who would it be at least half time there, likely full time there. One of the changes that you're gonna see on, on special ed and you will see this um, if you look in the detail that I sent you separately, is in the past we've taken two major grants, the, uh, the triple E grant which funds um, early ed special ed 
and the IDEA B grant, which is the, the bigger of the two in that um, funds both K-12 special ed and early ed special ed. I've been sort of showing those in your general fund budget, even though they're grants and um, then showing that revenue in your budget, um, even though it, it shouldn't be part of the general fund. Um, because we're moving accounting systems uh, for the SU now, it's a little harder for me to do that uh, cleanly with the state. So I'm gonna pull both of those out. Um, it will make it look like Michelle's budget is down because of that probably $800,000 of expenses that is, is coming out. Um, that's not really necessarily the case. It's just those folks are coming off books and um, Michelle and I are gonna have to tune into um, being a little more intentional in terms of who or what expenses we put in those grants because they're ones that you're not necessarily gonna see. This year, the grants used primarily for your um, speech language pathologists. Um, and so if we continue that next year, I don't want you looking at your grant and thinking, oh, we only have two SLPs. It'll just be those are the only two that we're funding out of your local budget. So any questions on the moving people there? So I'm back on, it looks like Emily is off. Do we, do you still have a quorum? We do, right? We have Rick, Polly, Kat, oh, and Kat myself. Off. Yeah. Right. So I sent two other documents in your packet. One is that um, 16 page, probably um, excruciating detail line by line run through the budget. And that is following the same um, format as the one that I just, shared on the screen. I'm happy to, to walk through that with you. Um, given the time, I'm also happy to stay digested at your leisure. If you've got any specific questions on it, um, feel free to reach out to me offline and I can answer them. And then the second piece that I sent out is, um, is a staff listing. And the big change that I'm trying to capture there is really to to catch all the adults that are in the program. So you will see where you really haven't in the past if we're hiring five autism workers from NCSS across the district, you'll actually see those five positions listed out and an FTE assigned to them. Um, so that's really the big change um, from the, the way it was presented last year. And I can walk you through that um, on screen now or ask questions later as, as you guys want. Um, well, Morgan, I, I think I'm um, leaning toward people reaching out if anything in the packet, in your packet feels, um, you know, like they warrants clarification, just given the late hour, we still need to do central office updates, board business and an executive session. So I just want to be mindful of the late hour. Um, Rick, Kat, Polly, do you all feel comfortable with that? Because I can certainly defer. That works. I'm good. Okay. Rick, you good with that? Yep, I'm fine. Thanks. All right, perfect. Okay, um, you know how to get a hold of me and um, unless there are any other questions, that's all I've got for tonight. Great, thanks so much, Morgan. Um, all right, so for central office updates, we, um, Dominic, do you have anything that you'd like to elaborate on or any questions from the board for Dominic? No, okay. Um, and Jody and Michelle, we had your spotlight. So I assume you are both probably in good shape as far as anything further. I have nothing further. Okay. I have nothing either. Great, thanks. Um, Michelle Irish, do you have anything that you'd like to highlight from your um, board report? I don't have anything specific, no. Okay, any questions for Michelle, folks? Okay, um, Heather Moore, anything that you'd like to highlight? I loved the, oh. YouTube, vid I loved the YouTube video that you sent 
Pretty watching nice. watching Phil Scott, Don and Bernie watch Don their capes. That was wonderful. Yeah, that was really exciting. Yeah, yeah. that was it was so well done and great to hear from all those um, contributors and the kids. So yeah, I appreciate you sending that along. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I have nothing more to add though. Okay, super. Thanks. Um, Dawn, anything that you'd like to highlight from your um, food service report? No, I think I'm good. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, Melissa, anything that you'd like to highlight? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Robin? Nothing further. Okay, great. Any questions for any of those folks? Okay. Uh, Gabby, anything that you'd like to highlight? Touch um, on? The numbers are a little bit different. We got four new K-6 this week and two middle school students. Nice. But other than that, nothing. Um, thanks for sending the link to the website along. It was great. I loved seeing that. It was cool to see the calendar and how you structure the days. And um, it's, a, it's a really uh, user-friendly platform, the website. It's well done. I appreciate that. Great, good feedback. And if anybody has any questions, I'm certainly willing to answer. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Gabby, folks? All right. Um, so then moving on, we've got our board business um, for future agenda items. Um, I know we still need to get that doodle poll um, out and filled out for our um, last two hour working session with Mike. So board folks should keep their eyes out for that doodle poll when it gets sent out, hopefully next week. Mary, um, I, I did check with, with Courtney earlier and she was waiting on dates from Mike. So those, she'll send that out as soon as we get those. Okay, perfect. Thanks for the clarification, Lynn. That's great. You're welcome. Um, and I know Polly, thank you for sending along that, um, the superintendent eval uh, pages from the VSBA. So at some point we'll need as a board to figure out how, when we're gonna do a working session around um, the superintendent uh, job description, board job description and some of those things. Um, and, uh, I guess then we can move. I just need a motion to move into executive session. And with that, I think we can let um, everyone go. Um, our next meeting will be on the 15th. I hope everyone has a really lovely, uh, safe, delicious, healthy Thanksgiving break, much needed rest. Um, we'll to go into executive. Great. By roll, Polly. Aye. Emily. Oh, sorry, she's gone. Rick. Aye. Kat. Aye. And Mary is an aye. Have a lovely Thanksgiving. And you are out of executive session. All right, we're out of executive. We have no motions pending based on executive. And all I need now is a motion to adjourn. Um, Thanks, Polly. Um, everyone give a wave. Wish you all a really joyful Thanksgiving. Be safe.